Welcome back, everyone. Looks like a, another big group, just like yesterday's. Um, I'm Wayne Stacy from the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology, and this is day two. And it's a packed agenda, so I'm going to turn it over to Mike to get things started as quickly as possible for you. Uh, thank you for coming and enjoy. Great. Thanks, Wayne. Uh, next slide, please. So here's our agenda uh, for day today. It's a, it's a pretty aggressive agenda, so we'll, we'll get right at it. Um, a couple of things before we get started. Uh, I want to remind everyone to please use the chat function if you have questions. We will uh, address the questions at the end. At the end of the hour, we'll finish our presentations and we'll turn to uh, the question session um, at one o'clock uh, Pacific. So uh, next slide. So I'm gonna to talk today about intellectual property strategies for edited plants, next. So just a quick uh, recap on, on what Steve uh, Della Porta talked about <clears throat> yesterday. Steve talked about identifying a mutant lemon tree that was resistant to citrus greening. And he talked about finding this YFG uh, mutation, this mutation in the YFG gene. He then introduced that same mutation back into a wild type lemon tree and created the same resistant allele. So this was an edited stop codon at position five. So next slide. You can then take that knowledge, that information, introduce that same mutation into grapefruit, limes, and orange to create resistance in other citrus crops. Next slide. In our example, what we're going to talk about is a resistant orange tree and how to go about protecting it. Next. So it's important to keep in mind that there's intellectual property protection and contract protection for these plants. Next. We're going to focus today on IP, but I want us to always remember that we should never be transferring plant material to other people without a contract in place. There's, with IP protection, you can get increased damages, injunctive release, and enforcement against third parties. But it's always important to keep in mind contracts, which is the subject of an entirely different presentation. Next slide. So let's turn to IP protection and plants. Next slide. So when you think of plant IP protection, there are really multiple ways to go about with, with uh, IP protection. We have trade secrets, variety names and trademarks, plant breeders rights, and also plant patent protection, plant variety protection, and utility patent protection. The first three topics we're not going to cover at all. Again, these are the subject of completely separate presentations. We're going to focus today on plant patent protection and PVP and utility patent protection. Next slide. So first, whoops. Yeah, next slide. First, um, the, the types of plant variety protection in the United States. 35 USC is for plant patents. Um, these are for asexually reproducing plants. 35 USC one, section 101 is for seed producing plants and asexually reproducing plants and traits and transgenic plants. The first two are both for patent protection in the United States Patent Office. The third form here is uh, plant variety protection. This is governed by 7 USC 2327. It used to be that PVP protection in the United States was only for seed reproducing plants. That's changed. And now you can protect asexually reproducing plants under the USDA for PVP protection as well. Next. So how do patent and PVP protection differ? Well, there's no research exemption for patent and varieties. In contrast, when you have PVP protection, there is a research exemption. exemption. So you can use um, a, a third party, can use PVP protected material in breeding. That's not so for patent and varieties. So if there's a patent on the orange trees that we're talking about, no one can use those in breeding. PVP protection also covers a single variety and essentially derived varieties. Plant patents cover just a single variety. And then when we talk about utility patent protection, that can be considerably broader. You can get trade claims and you can get potential coverage under the doctrine of equivalence, which we're gonna discuss later today. Next slide. First, a bit about claims. Next. 
So PVC PV certificates have no claims at all. Plant patents have only one claim. And utility patents can have all sorts of different types of claims. You can claim breeding methods, deposited tissue culture, trait claims, edited plant claims, and on and on. There's a variety of different ways that you can protect orange trees with utility patents. Next. So we're going to protect our edited orange tree. Well, plant variety protection used to not be available in the US for uh, orange trees, but they, they are available now. Why? Let's turn to the next slide. Well, orange trees reproduce by cuttings. They don't reproduce by seed. It used to be that you had to reproduce by seed in order to get PVP protection. But with the change in the law, we can now protect things that reproduce by cuttings, such as orange trees under PVP. Next slide. Next slide. So what are the PVP protection requirements? Well, first, there's a fee of 5150. This is considerably higher than the patent office, uh, patent application fees. So that's something to keep in mind. You also need to come up with a variety name. You're going to need for an orange tree, instead of a seed deposit, you're going to need a plant tissue deposit. Because the rules and regulations under the PVP are just getting going, this requirement has been delayed until January 6, 2023. So the applicant has to declare that they're going to maintain the propagating material at some specific location that could be inspected. In order to get PVP protection in the United States, you have to show that the plant is distinct, uniform, and stable. Probably one of the keys when thinking about protecting an orange tree is that the term is 25 years from grant. So keep in mind that patents are 20 years from filing. So when you're thinking about protecting as something as valuable as in an edited orange tree that's resistant to citrus greening, an extra five, six, seven years that you would get from PVP protection, 25 years from grant, could be quite valuable. Next slide. But let's talk about plant protection for orange trees. So the requirements are that the plant must be invented and sexually, asexually reproduced. You need to have pictures of the orange tree and you need to provide a lot of detail on that orange tree, leaf shape, flower color, et cetera. One of the unique aspects of filing for plant patent protection is that unlike with utility patents, where you can't add new subject matter as the patent once the patent application is filed. With a plant patent application, you can add additional subject matter. In fact, the examiner usually demands it. They request that you provide additional material, additional description of the variety, and that gets submitted to the patent office. You need to provide comparisons to the parent variety, and you must, that plant that you're trying to protect must differ with some characteristics. Clearly here, when we're able to show that our orange tree is resistant to citrus screening, we, we meet that criteria. And it must not be obvious. Next. Here's an example of a plant patent claim. They're pretty easy to draft. You know, they just simply call out what you're trying to claim as described and illustrated herein. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about utility patent protection for orange trees. Next. So what are the requirements? So the plant must be new, must be useful, must be non-obvious, and it must be adequately described. So first a moment in thinking about protecting a known gene or a known trait. So there was a question yesterday during our presentation about whether you can patent a, a, a gene, a naturally occurring gene. The answer is no, and we'll talk about the claims in a minute, but you can claim the plants that contain that gene. But it's important to understand that Gene editing is a relatively well-known technique currently. And if you've got a known gene and a known trait, you may have trouble getting broad claims to an edited plant because of obviousness. You've got known gene, known trait, known techniques. Why isn't that obvious? So that's an important thing to consider as you're going through your patent protection process under utility patents. And that patent application must support the claims. And there's a key is how many edits do you have? Well, in our scenario here, we only have one edit. We've got that stop codon that we've introduced at position five of the YFG gene. So we've got just one edit. So that's something we have to think about as we go through this application. Next slide. 
So utility patent claims, as I've discussed, they can be a variety of different types of claims. Next slide. So here's an example of a tissue deposit claim for a utility patent. You simply have to deposit the, the tissue culture for the orange tree with something like the American type culture collection, which will give you a particular number. And then you claim that particular seed deposit. An orange tree is grown from that seed deposit and then an orange from that orange tree. So these are the dependent claims that would claim uh, priority to that first independent claim. Next slide. So I wanna spend a few moments on utility patent claims and trait. So look at this claim here. We've got an orange tree comprising a YFG gene with a stop codon. And I've gotten parentheses at position five, wherein said orange tree is resistant to citrus greening. The reason I've highlighted this in red is that I would take the position for the first claim that you go after, I think that you wanna include the language at position five. And those of you who've drafted claims might be thinking, well, why would you wanna narrow the claim that much? Well, I think you may have challenges perhaps in trying to claim if all you've got is one stop codon that you've done one edit one edited plant that you've created, and that's at position five, and you don't have any other edits, that the patent office may push back if you try to claim any stop codon in that gene. I think you're gonna need additional data and show mutations that you've created using additional stop codons. So for our example, we're gonna go after this claim in the beginning with the language at position five. Next slide. So here's our claim. So the question is, a competitor comes along and introduces a stop codon at position 10. Remember, our claim is limited to position five. So all they've done is create the same orange tree, but put it in the mutation at a different spot. Do they infringe? Next claim. Next slide. Sorry, this is good. So under literal infringement, the stop codon at position 10 does not literally infringe. So they'd avoid infringement of our claim. But what about infringement under the doctrine of equivalence? Infringement under the doctrine of equivalence or DOE will only apply if the claim is not amended during prosecution. So you need to start with that narrow claim that I talked about, with that red language included in that claim so that it doesn't get amended during prosecution. If the claim starts and ends at the same point, the same language, then the doctrine of equivalence will apply and then you would apply the function way result test to see if they infringed. So does it perform substantially the same function in substantially the same way to obtain substantially the same result? Well, I would say the function, it's an edited gene that results in a truncated protein that's being produced. Same way, it's a stop codon, the same result, citrus greening. So I would argue that that claim would be infringed under the doctrine of equivalence. Next slide. So quick comment on plant patent claims versus utility patent claims. Next. So plant, plant patent claims are quite narrow. They only cover the plant itself. You have to take a cutting in order to infringe that tree and independent development. So if somebody else were to introduce that same mutation into a, a plant, a plant patent would, may not cover it because that plant patent coverage is very narrow. You have to literally take a cutting of that tree in order to infringe. In contrast, claims to utility patent can be quite broader. Yes, thanks. From, from flexible to not so flexible, I would introduce my, my talk. Um, I will uh, first talk a little bit about GMO uh, regulations in the EU, EU generally before jumping into CRISPR gene edited related uh, issues. Um, next slide, please. Um, the use of GMO and the ICANN uh, on the slide already indicates is heavily regulated in the EU. Um, the relevant legal framework is laid down in Directive uh, 2001-18, the so-called GMO Directive. And pursuant to this directive, uh, an authorization for marketing and import uh, of GMO products is required. That comes along with uh, strict evaluation and safety assessment on a case by case basis and uh, the need to uh, apply unique uh, identifiers and labels on 
GMO products for traceability and transparency. Uh, so far, the theory. Um, in 1998, Monsanto's genetically modified maize uh, mown 810 was approved by the European Commission. But since 2001, there appears to be a de facto moratorium on authorizations. Uh, why a moratorium? Uh, because the procedures have become so complicated uh, and lengthy and intentionally unattractive that very few companies dare to even start the process, process it seems. But there are two exceptions. In 2010, after nine years of proceedings, the European Commission approved BASF's GM potato um, flora, but the General Court revoked, revoked that authorization in 2013 on formal grounds. BASF did not appeal uh, because they had meanwhile uh, withdrawn the product for, from the market uh, for lack of acceptance of GM products in Europe in general. Also in 2013, um, the General Court ruled against the European Commission and pushed forward an authorization for Pioneer's maze 1507. Uh, Pioneer filed their application also in 2001, so it took them 13 years to get to the European market. Next slide, please. So as a result, and as far as I can see, there are only two GM crops currently approved uh, for marketing in Europe, Pioneer's 1507 and Monsanto's 810. Um, but that's marketing. Um, how about cultivation? Uh, for cultivation, an even stricter, stricter legal framework applies in Europe because under Directive uh, 2015, 412, each member state has the right to restrict cultivation of GM crops regardless of whether they have been approved by the commission or not. And uh, based on that directive, 17 countries and four regions have opted out of GM crops. Um, there is a little uh, colored map uh, on this slide for illustration purposes. You can see, for instance, Germany is a non-GM country. Uh, on the other hand, Spain, for instance, uh, marked in blue, um, grows a lot uh, of Monsanto's uh, 810, for instance. And England, you will also notice, is a mark in blue. They allow cultivation. And it's going to be interesting to see uh, how the UK in general will position itself. And it seems like after Brexit, and it seems like they will um, be uh, much more uh, GM friendly in the coming years, months and years, and then they uh, used to be under the EU regime. Next slide, please. So now to the question, is CRISPR GMO in the EU? Uh, and I'm sure I'm not telling to this audience a secret. Um, it is. And uh, why is that? Uh, in 2018, uh, the Court of Justice of the European Union had to decide whether organisms obtained by novel in vitro mutagenesis technologies like CRISPR should be considered GMO and fall under the GMO regime. The background was that a French law exempted such organisms from the GMO rules. An, MG, an NGO challenged that law and asked uh, for a ban of a certain herbicide resistant rape. And they argued that in vitro mutagenesis could pose the same risks as GMOs obtained by transgenesis. Next slide, please. Um, here's a high level summary of the relevant legal texts that the Court of Justice of the European Union had to interpret and apply. Uh, Article 2 of the GMO Directive basically says anything that has been altered in a way that does not occur naturally is a GMO. And then there is an Annex 1b of that directive that describes mutagenesis as a method of genetic modification. So, by principle, it is GMO, but excludes it from the directive. On the other hand, um, there is in recital 17 of the GMO directive, um, which says um, that the directive shall not apply only to such techniques of genetic modification uh, that have a long safety record. And last but not least, Article 4 of the GMO directive emphasizes that overarching uh, principle, a precautionary principle, it is called, 
um, that has to be applied to ensure that adverse effects which might arise um, from deliberate release of GMOs on the market. Next slide. So against this background, uh, the court's main arguments were when banning CRISPR uh, that the process of novel editing te technologies like CRISPR do not occur in nature, although the products might. Uh, they put a lot of emphasis on recital 17 and said, uh, CRISPR does not have a long safety record, so it cannot apply uh, or it cannot fall under the exception of the general exception of mutagenesis in uh, Annex 1b. And they supported this uh, restrictive um, view um, by the precautionary principle that's also laid down and explained earlier um, in the directive. So in a nutshell, the decision said organisms obtained by novel mutagenesis are considered GMOs if they do not have a long safety record. And CRISPR is just in the view of the court, a too new technology to fulfill that requirement. Next slide, please. So um, again, this decision is probably known to everybody and so is the reaction. Uh, it left um, the industry in a shock, basically. Um, uh, but the Euro Commission took um, immediate action and initiated a study uh, to um, get a better understanding of what these technologies actually mean and what their impact is. And the result of this study has recently been published in April. Um, and um, it revealed, uh, it's a pretty long document, but um, here is a summary of what it re revealed. Surprise, surprise, the study says there are no new hazards linked to targeted cis and mutagenesis. Um, it states that this, these technologies are very likely to contribute to a more sustainable agri-food system and thus benefit society. And obviously uh, banning these technologies from the EU market may result in a competitive disadvantage for EU operators. We are seeing this uh, already now. And uh, another finding which puzzled me most uh, is that the study revealed that only 21% of EU consumers have ever heard of gene editing, but there's still a general perception that such technologies are evil. The, the, the perception is just negative. Um, and another problem, um, which uh, again is, is probably nothing new to this uh, audience here that the study revealed that there is a basic problem uh, that there are no reliable methods to detect whether NGTs have been used or inserted into a product or not, uh, which will make uh, law enforcement and regulatory oversight very difficult. Next slide. So um, here are then the three main things that the study suggests. Uh, one is, uh, a more flexible case-by-case -case approach to assess the risks of NGTs seems desirable. Further policy action should focus on the disparity between public perception and public knowledge about NGTs, as public perception of these new technologies is key to market uptake and thus of great importance for realizing the potential of NGTs. Um, and however, with respect to other organisms than plants, so microorganisms or animals, or other uh, novel uh, genome uh, 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 editing techniques uh, other than um, cis and mutagenesis, an example that's stated in the study is epigenetic editing, um, for these uh, further knowledge must be built. So in a nutshell, thumbs up for um, cis and mutagenesis, but with respect to implants, but with respect to um, other um, organisms or other technologies, um, the study suggests more knowledge must be gained uh, before the current regulatory regime uh, shall be reconsidered. So what is going to happen next? And this study obviously was taken up uh, very favorably and, and positively by, by the industry in Europe. 
Uh, but what will happen next? Um, the Portugal will take over the EU presidency um, shortly if they haven't taken it over already. Um, but um, this topic is not on their agenda. However, in 2022, uh, French, France will take over the EU presidency for six months. And the French Minister of Agriculture is a purported supporter of NGTs. Remember, this whole case uh, that the European Court of Justice had to decide uh, came to the court from France, where they wanted to adopt a more liberal approach to, to these technologies in the first place. So there are, there are high hopes um, that uh, the French presidency will take this topic forward, um, uh, accelerate the um, impact assessments and, and other studies, follow-up studies that are currently being um, uh, conducted. And obviously the hope of the industry is that at some point there will be an express exemption um, of uh, CRISPR and, and, and other cis and mutagenesis um, technologies to be implemented in the regulation. Um, on the timeline, um, we are still very far away from, from getting to that result uh, because, um, and I think it is important to have a thorough um, debate on this in the public uh, this is a very policy driven topic, but stakeholders are positive and motivated following the release of that study to, to take this project forward. But it will take years, in my view, until we see a real liberalization of the GMO regime with respect to CRISPR or gene editing technologies in general um, in Europe. And with that, I turn it over to my colleague, Bethany. Thanks, Wolfgang. I saw in the chat a question about Bill's comment about the coordinated framework. Um, and if he wasn't clear enough before, I'll say it maybe a little more directly. It's not so coordinated. <laughs> we wish it was more coordinated. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about the FDA regulatory framework that is really just a piece of the US framework. Um, as Bill alluded to earlier, there, there's actually a, a good number of other aspects um, that he covers, both USDA and EPA related. So let's go to the next slide, please. So the FDA regulates human and animal food from plants. And this includes plants that are produced through the use of genetic engineering or genome editing. And they regulate this under the Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act, which many of you will be familiar with, and just simply holds them to the same standard as all foods that are produced, processed, stored, shipped, or sold in the United States. And the idea here is really a risk-based safety issue, um, is the the resulting food that will be eaten by humans or animals, the same level of safety as would be expected had it not been genetically engineered or um, subject to genome editing. And as was mentioned, there this FDA regulation um, purports to be part of a coordinated framework. However, with the secure rule and, and the, the frameworks moving forward at sort of different paces at the USDA and the EPA and the FDA, um, we do have to continually monitor what each of the different agencies are doing. <clears throat> and we do suspect that there will be some further FDA updates uh, to coordinate and align with the secure rule. Next slide, please. The FDA also under this framework of coordination amongst the different agencies includes a program called the pre-market consultation program. It's the, um, it's the coordinated framework and they, um, they ask for these consultations in a voluntary way. However, um, even though it's voluntary for any new plants, it is quite clearly expected from FDA if the plant is a gene edited plant. What they say in their guidance is that if a developer decides to commercialize a new genetically engineered geno or genome edited plant variety, FDA anticipates the developer should participate in the biotechnology consultation process. 
That sounds simple enough. Um, so what is a biotechnology consultation process? Um, this is actually a, a process of engagement that is voluntary in air quotes expected if you're doing um, any kind of genome editing plant variety, where you come forward, you meet with the agency, you identify and discuss safety, nutritional, and any other regulatory issues. So this is a, a consultation phase. It's set up to be quite informal. Um, FDA will host a meeting. Um, the FDA will provide feedback on the data and information that you've provided, and they will ask questions. Um, with or without an initial consultation, there's actually a final, more formal consultation phase when you submit something called a biotechnology notification file. So what you do is you package up the submission um, that will include data and information about essentially safety of the genome um, edited plant variety. In particular, FDA is going to be looking at issues. Does this contain new toxins? Does it produce new allergens? Is it going to be nutritionally different from the comparable food that's not gene edited? They are going to then evaluate that information, consult with the developer, come back, have these questions resolved, answered. And once all those issues are resolved and FDA, this is all in a really good process, <laughs> we're assuming that it ends up nicely, um, they'll issue a letter to the developer that will say they have no question about your safety and regulatory issues and remind you that you have to always make sure that the food that you introduce into the human food chain or the animal food chain remains to be safe. And what's interesting is there are there are already, although this has been in place for quite some time now, um, 188 biotechnology consultations in this public inventory list. And so we do know that um, that folks are doing this. This would not all be genetic engineered or, or genome edited um, plant varieties because this is a part of the voluntary program could be for introduction of other plant varieties that could go through this process. Next slide. So FDA, um, a little more pertinent to the idea of the coordination between FDA and USDA. FDA has a voluntary labeling standard and USDA, the Agriculture Marketing Service, has um, a fairly recent standard. It's the National Bioengineered Food Disclosure Standard, and that's a mandatory labeling standard. And so let's go to the next slide and I'll tell you a little bit about how each of these differ. The FDA program um, for labeling is certainly in a voluntary state. It's a guidance-driven um, standard that is asking developers and to, to voluntarily place information on their label to make sure that the food that they put into the marketplace is not, um, has not been cl making claims that are truthful and not misleading. And in the, in the guidance, one of the clearest examples is they say it's okay to, to make a claim that you're not genetically modified through the use of modern technology, but you should be careful to not claim something more simple, like not genetically modified, which could actually be misleading because um, some level of genetic modification could occur through traditional breeding processes. And so the idea is really focused at a truthful and not misleading standard. It's something that the Federal Trade Commission often uses. So we, we work from those same principles and the guidance um, from FDA does seem to align pretty nicely with this. Next slide. The USDA, on the other hand, has a compulsory la labeling requirement under the NBFDS. And this mandatory labeling requirement is for bioengineered foods or foods that contain bioengineered food ingredients. And so they actually define what bioengineered foods are. These are foods that contain detectable genetic material that have been modified through in vitro our DNA techniques, and for which the modification could not otherwise be obtained through conventional breeding or found in nature. This required labeling does not apply to certain entities. So there's a restaurant exemption, small manufacturers, or highly refined foods or ingredients that don't contain any detectable genetic material. There's a detailed record keeping that needs to be kept about um, your information and substantiation. And then also these um, beautiful symbols that you can see on the right here. These are the proposed symbols that you're allowed to use 
for your mandatory labeling. Um, you could also use words, just plain words if you felt like it, which is uh, bioengineered food or contains bioengineered food ingredients. So those are the phrases that they say are acceptable. And there is a list of bioengineered foods that are already subject to this mandatory labeling requirement that um, it's not going to be, a, it's not an exclusive list, it's just the list that they're giving as an example. So if you think that you fall into this category and require, have required mandatory labeling, you should be doing the labeling anyway. And also the list is not itself permanent, right? These are one of the um, regulatory disclosure lists that will continue to evolve, new things will be added to it. What we've not done, um, which I think would be interesting as the list grows, is to compare this compulsory um, labeling list and what the USDA through its AMS <laughs> division think are bioengineered foods that are required to have this labeling against perhaps um, that, that um, bioengineered technology inventory that is the compulsory or the, the voluntary um, negotiation process with FDA. I said there's 188 of them. And so um, over time, I think we'll start to see some alignment between those two lists and seeing what's actually out there. But for now, some of the things we know are required to have this mandatory labeling from USDA are alfalfa, certain types of apples. There's some canola, corn, cotton, and eggplant varieties that are on the list. There's a ring spot virus resistant variety of papaya. Um, there's a pineapple, potato, a certain type of a salmon, soybean squash and sugar beet. And so there are actually um, a good number of foods that have been identified on this list that are subject to the mandatory labeling already. And at this point, that's all we have from FDA. Um, there's a couple of other triggers that they may get involved in particular, they do oversee, um, I, I saw Bill's reference to this, they do oversee plants that have purposely had introduced into them pharmaceutical ingredients that are then grown and manufactured um, so that those pharmaceutical ingredients can be extracted for drug purposes. And FDA has a program that oversees that also. And with that, I think that wraps up the FDA regulatory piece. Right. <clears throat> Thank you, Bethany. So I can we go back to on your slide? I want to before we leave it. Can you go back? There we go. So our edited orange tree that we've been talking about um, sounds like would would not have to have this label. Is that correct? Because it, it we started with a mutant that was found in nature. And then we created the same thing. Do you agree with that? I would agree with that. Bill, do you agree with that? We're, we're looking for a coordinated framework here between the <laughs> FDA and the USDA. And based on, based on uh, you know, how, how the mutant was produced, I would agree. Yep. Hmm. So, but it's interesting, I guess the, the question here, so it's I've been modified through for which modification could not otherwise be obtained through conventional breeding or found in nature. So the fact that we found ours in nature is helpful to our cause. What if you hadn't found it in nature? You know, I guess that gets into a discussion of whether it could be obtained by conventional breeding and it could be. I think that's the problem with these, these rules. Anyway, okay. So we, um, we actually um, uh, attended a seminar yesterday where we, we posed some of these exact questions to USDA representatives that were giving an orientation. And I think the implementation, the idea we got back is that there's been very little thought given to how this is going to be interpreted and, and applied. They've all been so focused on the, uh, on the APHIS aspect. Um, so it's, it's, it hasn't really been fleshed out. Sure. So I'm just going back to the chat to make sure we addressed all the questions. The first one today was from Melinda asking about uh, patent protection across countries. Um, so with respect to plants, uh, plants um, are only patentable in, in, in a very few uh, areas. Um, the United States, for sure. Um, Japan on, on occasion, Australia on occasion, 
and there's a few handful of other countries where you can get a patent on, on your new plants. Um, but the PVP that we were talking about, uh, the equivalent around the world is what is known as PBRs or plant breeders rights. And plants are eminently protectable around the world um, by plant breeders rights. So that's how you'd go about protecting these orange trees that we've discussed is, is through plant breeders rights. And, and those are um, pretty much every, the, almost every country that you care about um, has some form of plant breeders rights protections. Um, we then have a question, are plants that have recombined genetics from within the gene pool also considered exempt? I think that's uh, for you. Um, and I don't know if we have Liz Freeman on if she wants to, to answer that one. Liz, are you on? Uh, yeah, I think Bill answered that one in, later in the chat, but I'm happy to chime in if there's still questions surrounding that issue. Yeah, why don't you chime in? Go ahead. Uh, so this is a question about the secure, APHIS's secure rule and the gene pool, and there is an exemption to the secure rule for single genes that are found in the plant's gene pool. Basically, if it's possible to breed through some even very complicated lab, intention, lab intensive method of traditional breeding to breed in that single gene from the gene pool, then that would be exempt under the secure rule, under the B3 exemption. Um, multiple genes gets hairier, maybe yes, maybe no, depending on the situation. Got it. So we also had a question yesterday on licensing and Otis Littlefield, I think you're, you're on. Do you wanna take that one on? Sure, sure. So the question was about if an academic or other, other nonprofit is acting under one of these um, research and development licenses that you can get, which are generally free from the various CRISPR owners, how does that impact where it says you cannot commercialize the product what about distribution in a nonprofit sort of um, means? And honestly, the answer really is it depends entirely upon the language of the license. So the license may just say there is no sale or distribution and you cannot transfer it, in which case the, the nonprofit distribution would not be allowed. Um, we've seen other variations of these sort of academic slash nonprofit, um, which do permit transfers, but they are under a limited sort of you as an academic or nonprofit can transfer it under an acceptable form of MTA to another academic or nonprofit for continuing the sort of academic slash nonprofit research. Um, but it doesn't seem to be that we've seen where there's broad ability to generate products that could be then put out there for you know, nonprofit distribution to say small hold farmers. Doesn't seem like that would be anticipated by at least the ones that I have seen. That's great, thank you. Are there other questions from the audience at all? We're happy to take them live if you feel free to speak up, use the chat. Sounds like no questions. There we go. Thank you. Would the EU regulate things like gene edited rootstocks the same way as whole plants? Wolfgang? Still on? Uh, I think yes. Um, I, I don't think they make a dis uh, distinction here. That's my answer to this question. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things in the EU is sort of the, that with Brexit is how uh, the UK may, may have different rules with respect to um, edited and GMO plants and, and whether that will be a business opportunity there. Um, they, yeah, uh, um, Boris Johnson has uh, um, articulated his sympathy for these technologies in many occasions. And uh, also, I mean, he was bashing many EU laws anyways <laughs> in, his, uh, uh, in his campaign, uh, but specifically referenced the, uh, uh, the holding of the European Court of Justice banning gene editing technologies uh, as a yeah, reason to support um, the split from the EU. 
So there will be more liberalization coming when and how and in what form I'm not uh, able to say, uh, but it's clear that they will um, move quicker and uh, certainly into the direction of more liberalization. And Wolfgang, how does it, you know, say we created some orange juice here in the States from this edited plant and that worked its way to, to, to Europe. Is, are there label requirements for that, that sort of edited orange juice? That's a, an unanswered question because uh, the, you, will, you will not detect, you will not be able to detect whether or not um, uh, the, the product itself is the result of gene editing. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. So Mike, I have a question about, you'd mentioned that around the rest of the world, they have PBRs. So yeah. I understand that Brexit impacted the sort of EU-wide PBR. Has that yeah. been a smooth division or is that still bumpy? No, it's, it's relatively smooth. I think we're coming up on the deadline the next, couple of weeks where there will be all the EU uh, PBRs are being converted if you choose to do so to UK PBRs. And then going forward, you'll just file two separate applications, an EU one and a, and a UK one. But they had a transition period, which is just about to close. So we've been filing lots of applications in the UK for clients who protected in Europe and now want the UK um, protection. Liz, there's a question here on plant products on the market so far. You want to comment on that? What's been approved? Um, on the market so far, that, that's kind of a broad question because I don't know what's been exempt and is necessarily being sold. But I think that is largely how um, the NBFDS labeling requirement list was constructed. That list is meant to encompass what they consider, what at least the USDA Agricultural Marketing Service considers a bioengineered food that's currently available on the market in, in the US. Um, and that list is posted online. Also, Bethany briefly read it off, but it I think it's a lot shorter than most people might suspect, but it probably will get longer quickly, especially as the at least the, the USDA APHIS secure rule streamlines the process um, and the, the new secure rule is meant in many ways to help um, small developers get through the regulatory thicket uh, much more efficiently. And they, they have a stated goal of, of getting more products out there as a result of that. And for those of you who are, <coughs> who are editing plants and thinking about approval, keep in mind the challenge associated with, you wanna get a patent on whatever the, your, your new edits are. And if you haven't filed your patent application and then you start to give information to the FDA or the USDA, which is then going to be made public, you can run into patent problems. So you need to be strategic about your seeking your regulatory approval and seeking your patent protection. Coordinate those efforts. So Monica is asking tension between regulatory fragment and patent requirements. Um, advantageous, do you see tension? I mean, just from the regulatory perspective, it's kind of a, uh, I, I see your point. I mean, you want to, if you have something in, that's already found in nature, you're going to be in a good position to argue that it's exempt, uh, that it doesn't need further regulation, and there's no evidence that it's a plant pest. Um, and to the extent it becomes more and more obvious, um, I don't know how that will, Mike, you can comment on how that yeah. will impact whether it's protectable. Yeah, no, I see where it's going. So in our example, where we discovered the mutation, I think you, we would want to protect that information to, to, so that it, it, we, we didn't create our own novelty problem. So meaning you've got an edit, it, you, you want to create that same edit, you, you can't commercialize that, that lemon tree until you've kind of moved forward and filed on your own patent applications. But if somebody else has already found it, um, you know, I don't know why, well, making the same edit, I think where Monica's going is 
something's known, you've got, you know, say our, our, our lemon mutation was known and it's taken us years uh, to sort of figure that out. And then we introduce that same mutation in orange. Um, you know, we might be able to get that a reg regulatory approval, but we might have problems getting broad patent protection on that. I think the, the plant patent would be easy to get. I think a utility patent would be much harder in that cir circumstance. And as Corey says, PVP would be good as well. But Dr. De Della Porta has asked, can I secure a broad claim on loss of function edited alleles by including several examples? Absolutely. I think that's the most important thing to do, Steve. You need to, it, the, the, in order to get broad protection, and I alluded to this in the patent discussion, you need to have multiple examples. Relying on simply one edit is going to make it very difficult to get broad patent protection. Well, if there are no further questions, I want to thank everybody for joining. We will have uh, additional seminars in the future with deeper dives on these topics. We hope everyone enjoyed themselves. We certainly enjoyed uh, uh, giving the talk. So uh, good luck to everybody and uh, stay safe. Bye-bye.